All right, guys, today on the Star Wars show, we are joined by my friend, Lucasfilm Story Group's Pablo Hidalgo. Hey, Andy. Hi, Pablo. What do you want to talk about? Star Wars. All right. <laughs> I could do that. Yeah, so you've been with the company for a long time now. It'll be 17 years in February. That's wild. Yeah. And you've been a Star Wars fan since Star Wars became Star Wars. Since I was a, yeah. a wee, wee little child, yeah, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about how your fandom grew? You'll, you'll hear a lot of the same stories as far as uh, people around my age. I mean, Dave kind of said the same thing. Like when you're, when you're a kid who grew up uh, with Star Wars during the original trilogy, you didn't know that it was something unique or special, right? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily call myself a Star Wars fan back in the day because everyone was into it, right? It was just what was there. It's what kids talked about at school. It's the toys that you played with. It's the comic books you read. It's the books you read, right? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't notice that it was anything distinct or special and I didn't feel like I could qualify myself as a fan until Star Wars kind of went to bed in 1986, you know, when it stopped being uh, on the forefront of everything. So the Marvel series wound down, the toys stopped coming out. There just wasn't much going on with Star Wars at the time. But I kept the torch going, so mm -hmm. to speak. And it was like in 1987 when I went to a game store and found the Star Wars role-playing game, which was just freshly published by West End Games then I just became obsessed with it. And um, that's when I realized, okay, I'm a fan for life here. Because it, it became a place um, for me to tell my own stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what really got me interested in it. Yeah, you ended up writing guidebooks for Western games. Yeah, Game, yeah. Right? but I mean, that was like years after I'd started playing the game. I mean, I was only in junior high at the time. And it was at the time where, you know, it's the age when people get into tabletop role playing, you know, like D&D &D and stuff like that. Uh, but Star Wars was my hook for that kind of uh, uh, fandom, you know? Um, and again, like, it, it became, in my circle of friends, we'd all played different games, but only I could run the Star Wars game, because only I, like, I just became a control freak about it. Right? <laughs> um, and, I, and I took it upon myself to become as knowledgeable of Star Wars as possible in order to make as authentic an experience for my circle of friends who would play the game, right? Because mm -hmm. I didn't want them asking a question about the universe and me saying, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and even if I wow, didn't, that has become like your life. <laughs> well, yeah, right. And even if I didn't know, at least I could extrapolate in a way that builds off the knowledge that I did know. Mm -hmm. So at no point did they sort of see the seams of the universe. To them, it was like, okay, I'm in this fictional space, and I feel like no matter where I go, I could get a story. And that was sort of my, you know, implicit promise of, okay, if you're going to play Star Wars with me, and I'm going to run a, uh, a game as a game master, um, that's what I could guarantee to you. And you're going to feel like you're in Star Wars. Do you have any like campaigns that you stick out in oh, your memory? I, I played a lot of the packaged adventures and then customized them a bit to fit my particular group of, of characters. Uh, but as it stands, it's so funny. It's like there's little beats that now naturally recur in Rebels. And people are noticing it. And it's not like Rebels is telling a specific campaign or Rebels is tapping into anything that we specifically did. Mm -hmm. But it has to do with the archetypes that we are in Rebels and the types of stories that we, we used to play as, as like, uh, you know, as teenagers. It was always about a small group, a small band of Rebels that are relying upon themselves because they're constantly outnumbered by the Empire. And so you get the same dynamic with, like, a, you know, kids around a, a dining room table playing with pencils and dice in a role-playing game, as you do on this, you know, animated series that we put a lot of time and effort into. So I've heard from friends of mine from way back in the day who we used to play with, uh, and they'd be like, is this based on what we did? I'm like, <laughs> not literally, but it's got the same DNA. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. Like and there's, a few, there's a few Easter eggs for, for West End Games players. There, there is there. stuff, yeah, like the tracking device in season one that the Inquisitor uses to, to find the ghost. Dave and Henry needed a name for Ketsu's ship, and I threw out, how about the Shadowcaster? And I didn't tell them that that was the name of our ship and our campaign. <laughs> so, you know, my old friends from back in the day will say, like, that, that was what Star Wars was. Because it had basically disappeared from people's attention mm -hmm. and in a real way like 1987 to 1990 to me is a very uh, like it's sort of like my happy space as a fan not because like because of what was happening in Star Wars because there was nothing happening in Star mm -hmm. Wars but because that's when I sort of like took it and and decided no this is this is where I want to spend a lot of creative energy in, in telling stories and so in a weird way like it became it became more of this kind of artisan thing right 
Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, you, you hate to be that person who says, well, I was into Star Wars before it was cool because, you know. You're such a hipster. Yeah, it's not that, <laughs> exactly. But at the same time, there is something to be said when you weren't inundated by it. Uh, so you had the opportunity to kind of make it your own. So you'll find, like, there's a lot of fans who made the most of what's being called the dark times to sort of build up their own particular uh, type of Star Wars fandom. You recently, uh, Pete was recently talking to Steve Sansweet, and like that's when he made he started building his collection mm-hmm. during the time when Star Wars just wasn't on everyone's radar, and that gives you an opportunity to really make it your own. So you kind of developed your your Star Wars and storytelling bug through these games and, and growing up. How? Tell me about how you transitioned into making that your professional job. Well, it was it was a combination of things. Like it wasn't my only interest. Um, you know, I was also cultivating an interest in animation and filmmaking at the same time. But I never really consciously decided that the two of them, like to me, they were separate paths, right? Mm-hmm. Star Wars was my hobby, and uh, you know, animation and and filmmaking and that kind of exploration was more career-based stuff. Can you tell me a little bit more about you know your interests on on that end? Up in Canada, I grew up in Canada, and I used to volunteer at um, the National Film Board of Canada, and you know, it's got a very strong animation. Uh, background, very strong animation reputation. Uh, I think it has something to do with the town that I grew up in. Uh, Winnipeg spends like upwards of six months, if not more, in the dead of winter. Mm-hmm. You know, long winters, very cold, 40 below. We're talking giving Hoth a run for its money. Yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah, and so uh, there's something about Winnipeg that just produces a lot of indoor hobbies. <laughs> okay. So you're probably going to find the best model train builders. <laughs> You're going to be fine, you know, the m- most elaborate role-playing game uh, enthusiasts. And uh, hand-drawn and now CG animation had a very strong foundation there because you're stuck indoors for right. six months. And, like, why not draw hundreds and hundreds of drawings and paint hundreds and hundreds of animation cells? So um, I got into animation when I was a teenager, just, like, really just learning the craft um, and thinking, like, I don't know where what I had. My, my, I had this thought, like, maybe one day I'll get into ILM. Um, but I don't know how it, like, how practical that was, because mm-hmm. I'm thinking I'm a kid up in Canada. What's the, what's the likelihood of me landing a job at ILM? Like I was a big fan of ILM, big fan of visual effects. I wanted to know about the process and all that. So as I matured, those skills, I figured, okay, well, let me do something practical with this. I'm going to learn animation. I'm going to learn advertising because pretend, you know, there's always you could find a job. You, I may not make a film. But right. I could at least make money doing that kind of stuff. So I ended up transitioning more as a writer, though. I flipped a coin. I decided, like, well, I, I have illustration background, I have writing background. It ended up being cheaper for me to study <laughs> writing. And so I thought, well, if I could build a foundation as a writer, then I could, you know, maybe uh, take additional courses to, to polish up my animation skills. Uh, so as I was writing, then I started freelancing for the role playing game company. And that's that's basically like became I realized wait I can make I could do something professionally with Star Wars, and so then the whole thing eventually shifted within a few years, and that became my Star Wars became my day job by 2000. And how did you come to land at Lucasfilm? Uh, I freelanced for West End Games, mm-hmm. and uh, that kind of opened up a lot of professional doors. I would go down to Gen Con, which is the big uh, sort of tabletop. Uh, role-playing game game convention, mm-hmm. which is also a professional convention because that's when all the editors and publishers go, and that gives you s- an opportunity to meet face-to-face with these folks. So I had already been freelancing for a few years, and I'm like, I want to meet these folks. And I brought my own Star Wars encyclopedia that I did <laughs> as like a resource for myself, mm-hmm. and I wanted to show them, like, hey, guys, look what I did. And because I was thinking maybe I could get a job with the role-playing game publisher, because that might be pretty cool, right? But at that, at the 96 Gen Con convention, Steve Sansweet was there. And uh, Steve was doing Lucasfilm's marketing outreach to core fans about the special edition trilogy, which was coming out the following year. And so I got a chance to meet Steve, and I had heard through the grapevine that he was writing the Star Wars Encyclopedia for Del Rey Books. And I said, you know, Steve, I kind of, I've got my own encyclopedia. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, if you need help, if you need hand. And he took me up on the offer, so he sent me the manuscript, and I I offered notes on it. And so I kind of established this relationship with Steve, so he knew me not only as a writer, but as a Star Wars fan and someone who can, you know, handle Star Wars professionally. Um, So that, like, a few short years later, and I get to to show you, like, anything that happened, is like, a few short years later, in the fall of 99, 
there was a job posting uh, on Lucasfilm.com for an internet content developer, mm -hmm. which was essentially a writer for StarWars.com. And I just took a shot and applied for it, and I just kept getting callbacks and callbacks. And by January, I was flying down to Skywalker Ranch for an interview. I'd asked Steve whether or not I could use him as a reference, and he said no. I'm like, oh, well, why not? And it's like, because uh, I'm going to be interviewing you. <laughs> so it's, you so know, that worked out pretty well. It worked well. out pretty well, yeah. You went from writing your own encyclopedia, now you kind of manage a lot of keeping track of details and you do the visual dictionaries. Is that something that you've just, is that just a skill that you've had for a really long time? Like, you have an incredible memory. Yeah, it's it's where my memory most manifests itself. And it's like, it's not, it, it's not across the board. Because, like, <laughs> if it's fictional, I'll remember it. If it's real life, uh, if it's someone I've actually met, I have a hard time remembering those names, but you know, Rats Terrell, I'll never forget that guy's name, right? I like that guy. Yeah, so I don't know, I don't know what it says about me that that makes more of an impression than someone who, who I talk to, it's Andy, right? <laughs> someone I talk to face to face, right? Yeah. But hey, that's just the way my mind works. But like, I think everyone has this to some degree, right? Some people have sports statistics, some people have like, you know, Civil War history, right. some people can remember the presidents and you know, their 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 terms and all that it's like for me it's just this this fictional space that I'm really really good at recalling so you you came on kind of in the infancy of starwars.com so thank you mm -hmm. yeah good job yeah um, tell me <laughs> about how you kind of progressed through the company to where you are now in the story group yeah so one of the great things about Lucasfilm and you know this so uh, I'm saying this for the benefit <laughs> of the audience I suppose is that no matter how big this company uh, can be on paper, like you take a, you know, you can't list every employee and take a track like, wow, look at all those people. No matter how big this company can be on, in some regards, it, it feels small. It yeah. feels like a, you know, it's, it's a cliche to say it feels like a family, but it feels very small because um, you're encouraged to go outside of your discipline. You're encouraged to explore what else is going on here. So, you know, uh, the great thing about Lucasfilm is that ILM will give a presentation on their latest shader or their latest incredibly technical breakthrough uh, revolution and anyone could go to that, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not that's your discipline. So you get to meet a lot of people in different disciplines. And so in my regard, um, uh, up at Skywalker Ranch where I started, I was hired to do writing for StarWars.com. And the great thing about that is that required you to interface with the entire company because we wanted to profile Lucasfilm, we wanted to profile the state of Star Wars so that I would have to go interview someone at Skywalker Sound mm -hmm. or go talk to someone in licensing or talk to someone in publishing or talk to someone in whatever capacity. And so that got me out there and people quickly came to realize, well, this guy knows his Star Wars. And that just became part of making Star Wars stuff is like, make sure Pablo has seen it before it goes out the door so that we don't make some sort of misstep or you just have that kind of not only have a fan perspective, because I'm a fan, but just like, you know, I'll be the guy who will nitpick and say, you know, you flipped R2-D2, he should, that, that image is backwards, he's got his projector on the wrong side, which happens more often than you'd think. Right. Or used to happen more often than we you'd think. We have very strict rules about stuff like that, never flip images, never. Yeah, yeah, back then it was a little bit loosey-goosey, and now it's like, well, because I remember the stuff that would jump out to me as a fan before I ever started working here thinking like, didn't anyone see this? And it's, it's not like, it's just there's, there's so many moving parts that uh, I just became another one of those right. moving parts and looking at stuff. And so as more and more parts of the company realized I could be an asset in that regard, I decided to uh, kind of formalize the role and say, isn't there a capacity where I could look at everything that comes out? And then that was right around the time that, you know, Lucasfilm basically got reinvigorated with Kathleen Kennedy coming aboard and the, having this whole plan for more feature films. And she instituted the story group, you know, with Kiri Hart in charge of it. There was a core group and, and Kiri decided that they needed someone like me and someone like Leland and eventually someone like Matt. Mm -hmm. You know, folks who really know a lot of the details about Star Wars to not only offer that expertise, but also just offer the expertise of, of, of having been here having that institutional knowledge of knowing what we've done in the past, what was important to George, um, and that kind of stuff all, all in one package. There's a lack of information, I think, about what it is the story group does. A lot of people have misconceptions about the amount of power you have or the decisions <laughs> you make. Can you kind of 
give the Cliff's Notes version of, of your role? Yeah, I think the easiest thing that people will latch their heads around is like, oh, you must, you're must you like a continuity cop. And it's like, well, that's not really it, right? It's it's more about like, if you were to try to boil it down, is, is we work with any creative who is wanting to tell a story at Star Wars. And we help them find the story that they want to tell, but also make sure that story fits within the framework of Star Wars, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just about making sure the number of moons over a planet is correct. It's more about, you know, what thematically, what are you going for? And what's the best way to, to achieve that with Star Wars? And also, is the story that you're telling, is it something we've done before? Or is it something that's also actually in development somewhere else in the company? So we become this sort of, uh, this, this point that um, coordinates all storytelling across the board so that we don't, you know, inadvertently tell something that's contradictory, not only from a continuity point of view, but from a thematic point of view. Or if we are departing thematically for whatever reason, we understand the artistic decisions behind it. And not be, and it's never because, oh, we didn't know that was the right way to do it, or we didn't know. We did Y because we didn't know that X was an option. It's like, no, we'll make sure you understand that X is an option uh, so that it shores up your reasoning to do Y instead. So we're really like creative facilitators and we also communicate and keep the rest of the company up to speed on story development so that when the story is locked enough, because you know, we really believe these stories take time to, to percolate and, and evolve. When the story is locked enough, we'll be able to say, okay, folks in publishing or folks in uh, toy development or folks in whatever, it's like, this is what this the character is. Mm -hmm. So take that uh, because you know, there's always this excitement to latch on to something new, but sometimes you just got to give a story or an element or a character time to develop. You mentioned the Shadowcaster earlier, and mm -hmm. I know you, in the story group, had to kind of inject your personalities and details a little here and there. Do you have a favorite um, bit that you've made into a story or a detail that you've added somewhere? A lot of the things, I really enjoy working on the visual dictionary because it, it, it starts, it lets me fill in the margins. Mm -hmm. uh, to the degree that they should be filled in. I, I do believe that a lot of things should be left a mystery, let another person take what they want and turn it into a story. Uh, but in some cases, you know, I get inspired by the background details. So with The Force Awakens, you know... That visual dictionary is so much fun to read. Oh, well, thank you. I had a <laughs> lot of fun writing it, right? And, you know, the character of Sidon Athano, the Crimson Corsair, like, none of that was in there. Mm -hmm. Like, he had no name. I, you know, talked to some of the folks in development, and they said, oh, we, he's kind of like a pirate. He, he looks very, you know, he looks very swashbuckler because of that helmet and mm -hmm. the color. So I developed the backstory um, just like in a paragraph format. And said, so that this is who he is. These are the aliases that he uses. And this is his relationship with his first mate, just based on that little snippet that's in the movie. And what I really like is just taking, just scratching the surface of that character mm -hmm. and then giving it to another storyteller, like uh, in this case, you know, uh, Landry, who did the, the short stories and really told us a story about him yeah. inspired by just a little bit that I had, you know. So coming up with the, like, a lot of these characters do have names, but the further and further you get into the background characters, they don't. Right, like and the Dengue sisters. Yeah, exactly. I love that one. Yeah, or the, the band in, in Maz's Castle. I tried to come up with the most ridiculous blues-sounding musician names. You know, look them up and you'll see that they're pretty silly, but yeah. they're fun, you know. I also like that Maz makes her own socks. Yes, yeah. yeah of well, course. Yeah, I had to put them in there. My, my, my wife, Kristen, knits, and I thought, oh, that's a little, I know there's a huge knitting community out there, and I thought, you know what, if Maz is our way of getting knitters a uh, Star Wars character who shares their craft. That's wonderful. Why not? You're very active on social media, which is great because you're witty and fun to read. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And you take a lot of heat off of other people. Yeah, well. Yeah. How many times a day do you get asked if something is canon? <sighs> A lot. <laughs> I know. A lot. I could tell there. You know, I could, there's. I could tell when a user is asking me questions, not because they're genuinely interested. There's part of that, but because they're they've got a wiki page open on their other window, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Hey, this isn't defined. Let me ask this person." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, and I, I'll get twelve questions in a row. I'm like, well, "Wait a minute, you're just you're just doing homework." I'm doing your homework for you. I don't, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, engage me. Talk to me. Why do you want to know this? Is it interesting? Kind of thing. So, um, 
I get asked a lot about the Freemaker adventures, mm -hmm. whether or not they're canon. Right. And it's like, ah, you know, that's not my place to say. Mm -hmm. It's because it's not the, it's like literally the least important aspect of the show. <laughs> it's like, is it fun? Is it awesome? Is it adventurous? And people get caught up intensely in what's canon and what's not. And I think the way you put it once on Twitter was the best way I've ever seen it was, what is it? It doesn't matter to the viewer as much if it's canon, but it matters to the storytellers. To some degree, yeah, to some degree, but the only extent to which it matters is does another storyteller need to be beholden to it? And that's really like the, the functional definition of canon. Because what tends to happen is in, on you know, internet discussion is it becomes a definition of quality. Mm -hmm. And that's not our functional definition of it, right? Like it's like, is this canon? No, well then I don't need to pay attention to it. Right. It's like that, that's, that's you know, that does a disservice to things like Darth Vader and Son, to, to the right. Jedi Academy books, to, uh, you know, our Lego storytelling, all that stuff. Because, like, a lot of people love that stuff, and it never even enters into their mind if they need to understand it in this sort of weird, abstract, academic way. And I think it helps kind of people as a selection tool about, like, what they want to digest next. Yeah. Like, they're going to go through the canon books before they go back and, and find something that doesn't count or, right, right. you know. I would just hate for it to be like... In Limiting. The, right. Yeah. Or in the like the first three points of decision making you may make about a story. It, it's sort of, it's almost like the equivalent of cover art, you know. Cover art should not keep you out of a story that you may have an interest in. So if you want to hear about Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mindor, it shouldn't matter if that's a legend story because mm -hmm. it's a great story. Right. You know. Do you have a specific question that you get asked all the time that you definitively want to answer here <laughs> exclusively on the Star Wars show? Oh, uh, man, that I haven't answered already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I got to think about that because, you know. Yeah, like what can you say? Yeah. <laughs> That's also an interesting part about your job is that you, you have to be careful about what you say and you have to know what's been released and what's yeah. been publicized and what, you know, is in development. That's not too difficult. The, the, the tough part comes that I can't engage in speculation. Right. Which is like a huge part of being a Star Wars fan. And I'd love to. I'd love to get in there. But if by virtue of me speculating on something, I am then, I may inadvertently be telling you that it's undefined when you might think, oh, I bet you they have a plan for that. And then I start saying, well, you know, maybe it's this. And then you instantly start thinking, oh, they don't have a plan for that. You know? That's interesting. I've always been saying, thinking that it's your worry about confirming or denying things, but even speculating that there is no confirmation or denial is right. an issue. That's it can be. It can tricky. be. You know? And there are some things that will never be defined, like Yoda species. Right. So it feels like, but even like, the attempt of me trying to speculate on that, I don't want that to be misconstrued. And all of a sudden there's a headline on some blog somewhere that says, you know, Lucasfilm so-and-so, right. you know, confirms that Yoda's a frog. Is that tough for you <laughs> as a Star Wars fan, not being able to engage in those conversations? Because they are, I mean, part of, part oh, of our a, culture. It was a huge part. The trick is being able to engage in speculation in a form that allows me to fully explain yeah, but that's just speculation, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, the, the curse and, and, and blessing of social media. Because uh, it could be succinct, but then you're, it's so easy to grab that, that like quote out of, like, yeah, yeah. out of context. A typical example that, for whatever reason, I felt the need to get roped in on is the immediate assumption regarding Kylo's disposition about Kylo being a villain is that it's an indictment of Han and Leia as parents. I don't believe that. And so then I get uh, dragged into that conversation and I realize, like, I, I need to be careful because I might be taking away someone's speculation about Han and Leia, mm -hmm. uh, about exactly everything that happened. But at the same time, I feel important to say it's not because they're bad parents. You know, sometimes bad people just happen. Just happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of the questions are like, man, ask me in like a few months because there's so much like heated uh, speculation. Why don't we see this thing that's in Rogue One? Why don't we see it in episode four? Right. And the question comes from a, a point of view like, did you guys forget that episode four t follows and, and therefore you need to account for it? And it's like, you don't understand. All the questions that you are asking me right now, we've asked ourselves years ago. Mm -hmm. We thought about, hey, where are all the TIE strikers and shore troopers and all these cool things that are in Rogue One? Why aren't they in episode four? And there's a twofold answer. One is there's a practical answer, uh, but there's also, you know, 
we, we, we don't want to think that we've seen everything that's in the Star Wars universe in those first three movies. Right, because it makes the galaxy really, really small. Right, right. Yeah, because like at no point, you, you didn't want to think that someone would say, uh, Imperial Walkers, why weren't those in episode four? You know, it's like, well, <laughs> because we only saw one movie's worth of stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. You recently achieved a new milestone in Star Wars community where you had a cosplayer oh my God. recently. Yes. I would like to think it's a pretty, I hate to think she spent a lot of money on the costume because it's <laughs> probably know, fairly easy costume. It's pretty easy to get, right? You know, I've got a look that's been established by uh, Rebels Recon. And so that became this template for someone to dress up as me. <laughs> she was dressed up as Kathleen Kennedy the day before. There's a whole group of, of, of awesome chick fans that actually oh, yeah. get together at conventions I as I have Kathleen Kennedy. And there, it's brilliant. It should be celebrated. Cool. She's got Super impeccable cool. fashion shows. <laughs> that's what you should be cosplaying at, not just the guy in a hoodie. And uh, <laughs> But anyway, uh, so she warned me that she's like, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to be dressed up as you. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to see that. Because like, you could not get someone who's more opposite me than this tall blonde woman. Um, but she did it, and I appreciated it. So. That's so funny. So she had the coffee mug prop. And now you have the first of the Star Wars show mugs. Those aren't, those aren't even official really? yet. That's not even a thing. That's a prototype. It could be bigger. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming by, Pablo. It's always super fun to talk to you. Yeah, nice catching um, up. And, and yes, none of this is canon. <laughs> no. None of it. No, no, no. And stick around, guys. There will be more Star Wars show in just a minute.